Welcome to the lecture series in food biotechnology. This is part 8 of the series of lectures where we are talking about the applications or the tools of biotechnology which can be used one to increase the yield or maybe increase the shelf life of certain food specific food products or to improve the processing methods or the different variations which can be applied onto the field of food which are very wide. The simplest and the most important aspect of them has been the applications of plant tissue culture. When we take an X plant and actually introduce it into the medium, what you call as the expression of totipotency. As you are aware, Totipotency is when any plant part, when it is detached and put into a medium containing the suitable uh, hormones, the regulators and the other carbon and electron sources would have the capacity to completely form a new plant. This particular aspect has been actually used and used to bypass the conventional breeding techniques and also to create thousands of clones of plants, each of them having a specific aspect, especially in cultivated crops, this has been a boon because you are actually bypassing years and years of conventional breeding and selecting a particular plant. Instead of that, by tissue culture, you can select a plant and make thousands of clones of its own. And this can be introduced to the farmers. When the techniques of biotechnology actually came up, that we knew that a new gene can be introduced into a plant and then we can actually manipulate this and create, say, suppose your gene, new gene which you have introduced has something to call for, for disease resistance or it makes the plant resistant against a certain fungal pathogen or a bacterial pathogen. You are indirectly influencing when the plant becomes resistant, it means that you are indirectly influencing the yield of the plant. The other option is increase the nutritional capacity that is uh, per calorie how much of nutritional component a plant gives if you can increase it a little bit or maybe increase the vitamin content or the mineral content by manipulating the genome then that also makes much more uh, difference to especially in the developing countries. So these techniques and the fundamental applications of biotechnology have been utilized with the advantages of tissue culture in promoting uh, improvement of food crops. So the propagation of shoots or the nodal segments is usually performed in four stages for the mass production of plantlets through in vitro vegetative multiplication. There are two methods here. One is organogenesis whereby you ask the explant to give rise to an organ. The other one is direct plant regeneration. So this organogenesis is a common method of micropropagation that involves in the tissue culture pathway and it also involves in the tissue regeneration of adventitious organs or axillary buds and these are either direct formation or indirect formation from the explant. Non-zygotic embryogenesis. See, normally an embryo is formed when the male gamete and the female gamete fuse together. So in the case of plants, the pollen and the ovary fuse together to form the seed. And that zygote, when it germinates, that is the normal embryogenesis. But here we are talking about non-zygotic embryogenesis. This is by stimulating a developmental pathway, which is highly comparable to the zygotic embryos. And this is an important pathway for developing somaclonal variants by developing artificial seeds, and synthesizing metabolites. That is, you are actually making a somatic cell develop into a zygote and follow the embryogenesis. We can otherwise call them as adventitious embryos, having the characteristics of the mother plant. And it that would be advantageous to us. Plant tissue culture is used widely in plant sciences, forestry, and in horticulture. The applications include the commercial production of plants used as for potting, for landscape, for florists, 
which uses the meristem and the shoot culture to produce large numbers of identical individuals. It can also be used to conserve rare or endangered plant species. This actually has become very important these days because of the growing population concern in the world, we are losing a large number of ecosystems. Habitat destruction, forest areas have been destroyed either to create industries or for creating dwellings or to be converted into something else. Net result that basic ecosystem, the flora and the fauna of an area gets completely destroyed. And till this day, we have a lot of plants with even medicinal properties which Many of them are known, many of them are unknown. So, when the ecosystem or the habitat get destroyed, naturally the plants will become endangered. In some cases, they will become extinct. And in some other cases, when we want to take up the medicinal components or to extract out the medicinal uh, components from the plant systems, if the plant itself is very rare and comes under the endangered uh, list, then it becomes more difficult because that component which you are looking for, the pharmaceutical component or the drug which you are looking for would be a very minor aspect and you would have to destroy or you would have to have kilograms and kilograms of plant mass to get a, a small component of your drug, which means that you are destroying the uh, plant for getting the medicinal component. All this can be actually bypassed by using tissue culture. You can create clones thereby creating more copies of the plant so that you will have more cultivated plants so it can be moved from the endangered list. At the same time, you can also create clones from which can be used for the extraction of the components which you are looking for. So this, is, this actually becomes a very handy tool. A plant breeder may use tissue culture to screen cells rather than plants for advantageous characteristics. So see, in a conventional breeding, a plant produces thousands of seeds. Each of these seeds has to be planted. They have to grow up. And in some cases, if you are looking for specific characteristics in the fruit, you will have to wait till the time, till the fruit set happens in the natural manner to find out whether the plant contains the characteristic which you want or not. But in the case of it using a tissue culture, we can analyze. Since now we know that, okay, this gene codes for this particular characteristic, or the overexpression of this gene will give this particular metabolic pathway becomes activated. Right in the tissue culture level itself, in the single cell, we would be able to screen the cell which we are going to propagate, find out whether it has the characteristic which you are looking for, and then propagate that. So the selection does happens in the lab level itself at the single cell stage. Instead of waiting years to get the seed to germinate, grow into a plant, then get the product and then see whether the product has the characteristic which you are looking for. A typical example of this is herbicide resistance or herbicide tolerance. During natural evolution, some plants can have natural or what you call as spontaneous mutations, making them have this herbicide resistance or tolerance to some extent, whereas among the same population, what I call as wild population, you might have one or two plants which undergo spontaneous mutation to give, this, give rise to this characteristic. In tissue culture, you can screen them, they screen the cells itself to find out whether the, such a characteristic is present. Then select those particular cells which show the characteristic which you want and then propagate. So by propagation, you will get thousands of clones which actually contain the herbicide tolerance or whatever is the characteristic you are looking for in the plant. The large scale growth of plant cells in liquid culture in the bioreactors for the production of valuable compounds like the plant derived secondary metabolites and the recombinant proteins used as biopharmaceuticals. We have many plants which are as I said sources of drugs. Especially, we have so many anti-cancer, anti-tumor compounds which are present in the plants. You have secondary metabolites uh, which have very strong antioxidant capacity. When you want to extract such components, as I said, destruction of plants, we are going to indiscriminately kill a huge biomass. Whereas, 
when we grow the cells, identify the cells in a liquid culture, in a bioreactor or in a fermenter, we can actually create an ideal environment whereby you can get the product out from the cells either by a, a continuous culture or a fluidized bed reactor or even towards the end scale up grow the cells to a specific state when you are going to get the mass production of the particular product and then destroy the cells to get the purified product out. In all these conditions you have to optimize the various requirements but still this is a better chance than by discriminately destroying the wild plants and getting the product out. Secondly, these uh, bioreactors give us an uniformity because the conditions are uniform, we get a uniform product especially which is very important in the case of drugs. And it can also be used to cross distantly related species by protoplast fusion and regeneration of the novel hybrid. When plant cells have a cellulosic cell wall and inside this cellulosic cell wall you have the plasma membrane. So when you remove the cell wall, what you get is the plant cell with the plasma lemma covering which we call as a protoplast. Protoplast can be fused together, there are various techniques by electroporation or by PEG mediated transformation etc. etc. Uh, see, normally when we have two distinct species, normal fertilization is not possible between them because of various incompatibility factors. But when we take the protoplasts of two different species, we can make them fuse together to give a hybrid. And in such cases, such hybrids formed. In natural conditions, they would become infertile, especially because they are from different species. But when under protoplast condition, when we do this fusion and under the lab conditions, we can germinate them and we can screen them or we can have them exhibit specific characteristics which you want. This again normally cannot be done very efficiently in nature, but this is a potential application of plant tissue culture. It can be used to rapidly study the molecular basis for the physiological the biochemical and the reproductive mechanisms in plants, for example, in vitro selection for stress tolerant plants. Plants, as you know, are rooted to a place. Animals, when they are threatened, can run off, but the plants don't have that advantage. So, whatever is the stress condition, biotic or abiotic, since they are rooted, they have to face that, survive that. So, for this, they will have various adaptations. So it is like they are facing a stress. Those particular plants which can withstand the stress will survive. The others among the same. If I am talking about the same species, the same cultivar, when all of them face a stress, some very sensitive plants will die off. The ones which are able to adapt and survive will survive. So this adaptation might be because of a mutation or a small change in the metabolic pathway. So what is the basis? So when I give this stress, this is the metabolic pathway which is activated or this metabolic pathway becomes more expressed or these, these products get reduced. This gene gets activated or this gene gets inactivated. All this is actually easy to study under lab conditions rather than simulating it in the field conditions. To cross pollinate distinctly related species and then tissue culture the resulting embryo which would otherwise normally die. This procedure we call it as the embryo rescue technique. When you cross distantly related species or even if it is an intergeneric cross that is two distinct genus. Under the Linnaeus system you have a genus and a species. Within a genus the species will have certain similarities. There would be some differences. So you can have an interspecific cross or an intergeneric cross. Interspecific cross normally would be much more fertile than an intergeneric cross where we are talking about two different genus together. So the incompatibility factors would be much more. So in such cases, when you make such crosses, to the resulting embryo might normally not survive. Basically in plants you have what you call as a double fertilization and all of you know 
that it is the endosperm which is which is triploid which is because of the fusion of the polar nuclei with one of the tube nucleus one of the pollen nucleus which gives rise to the three and endosperm that actually serves as the food or the nutrition source for the growing embryo but on in intergeneric crosses there wouldn't be compatibility between this so the food source would be there but your zygote will not be able to take it up because of signal pathway uh, becoming haywire or because of some other misfactures because of which the embryo would not survive so under such conditions when you take up those embryos and put them in the tissue culture medium these intergeneric embryos would survive because all the nutrition is provided by the medium which the zygote can take up and it would still grow up so such embryo rescue techniques are very common for chromosome doubling and induction of polyploidy and for example for doubled haploids and tetraploids normal cultivated plants are actually polyploids most of them this is a feature which is normally seen only in plant kingdom when you consider animalia when you consider humans for us normal is diploid in the gametes it becomes haploid the zygote is again diploid polyploidy is an aberration usually distinct by uh, physical characteristics there would be associated disease symptoms like down uh, aberrations mental strength and mental processes would be affected people would normally be sterile so that is normal so diploidy is common in animalia whereas in plant kingdom it is polyploidy which is common and these polyploids have a lot of advantages so when we want to learn about how this polyploidy is induced the developmental pathways how they affect for all those we can uh, use again tissue culture so what we do here is uh, apply, apply my anti mitotic mitotic agents like colchicine or orazolin during mitotic division at the metaphase stage the chromosomes are in the center of the cell and then uh, during the anaphase you have the spindle fibers coming attached pulling the daughter chromosomes to the different fields at that particular stage after once the chromosomes get pulled to the poles then you will have the formation of the cell wall and the separation of the two daughter cells but at the metaphase stage when you apply colchicine the contraction of the spindle fibers the attachment and the pulling apart into the poles and the separation of the two daughter cells are inhibited as a result the chromosomes are doubled but the cell is still the same Con the single cell still contains the uh, double chromosome number so this is actually a technique which is normally used effects of this can also be studied during plant tissue culture then we can create a tissue for transformation followed either by short term testing of the genetic constructs or regeneration of the transgenic plants that is cell level itself we can do the transformation get the product out or look for the effect of transformation or the transformed cells you can select ask it to regenerate into a plant and then test for your transgene whether it is present whether it is getting expressed whether you are getting the product out in the grown plant certain techniques such as the meristem tip culture can be used to produce clean plant material from the virus stock such as sugarcane potatoes and many species of soft fruit normally in a plant from the root tip to the apical tip of the shoot the plant is interconnected by the vascular tissue so when a plant gets infected by a pathogen especially viruses that infection will spread throughout the plant especially in the case of viral infection it is only the apical meristem of the plant which is usually free from viral viruses all the rest of the parts would have viral particles if we use these meristem part from an infected plant and then create clones you can get a virus free stock production of identical sterile hybrid species can be obtained large scale production of artificial seeds through somatic embryogenesis as i mentioned earlier somatic embryogenesis is something where you are creating a somatic embryo which will germinate like your normal zygotic embryo and give rise to a plantlet so we can create artificial seeds by inducing somatic embryogenesis
the preliminary requirement for all these tissue culture protocols is the composition of the medium, the culture medium. So we have a large number of culture media which are commonly used, the MS medium, the B5 medium, the LS medium and White's medium etc. The first and foremost among these is the Murashigo and the Skoog medium otherwise known as the MS medium. This media was invented by two scientists Toshio Murashige and Farke Skoog in 1962 while the two scientists were working on the discovery of plant growth regulators. They were working on the plants to identify the various growth regulators which are secreted by the plants during which time they discovered this media. Till date, this is the most commonly used tissue culture medium in any lab. When we write the composition of the MS medium, we have certain numbers behind the MS. This indicates the concentration of sucrose in the medium. For example, if I say MS0, it means that the medium does not contain sucrose. And MS10 indicates that the media contains sucrose in a 10 gram per liter concentration. The formulation is a blend of nutrients like inorganic salts, vitamins and amino acids. This medium is used to induce organogenesis, callus culture, micropropagation and cell suspension. Linsmeyer and Skoog medium otherwise called as the LS medium. This was developed by Linsmeyer Skoog in 1965. This was first used to optimize the organic supplements of the tobacco culture, specifically for tobacco, what are the substituents which are required in the medium to proliferate the callus and then let it grow up. So for that, we the scientists had optimized Linsmeyer and Skoog medium. The medium has a similar component like the Murashige and Skoog media. The, with a twist, that is with the addition of the Linsmeyer and Skoog vitamins. So, it basically Murashige and Skoog medium with a variation in the composition of the vitamins, which we call as the Linsmeyer and Skoog composition. So, here they found that the increased concentration of thymine hypochlorate, 0 0.4 milligram per liter rather than 0.1 milligram per liter. That is, the normal Murashige and Skoog medium contains only 0.1 milligram per liter concentration of thymine hypochlorate. Whereas in the case of LS media, we add 0 0.4 milligram. It also contained inositol, like other vitamins are absent, we have only inositol there. Inositol is very important for a tissue culture medium because it is an enzymatic cofactor in glycolysis as well as in TCA cycle and it is also believed to be involved in the primary and secondary metabolism of the plants. LS media is used for the purpose of organogenesis, callus culture, cell suspension and micropropagation. The next media which was to be formulated is the Gamboge's B5 medium developed by O. L. Gamboge in 1968. He was working with legume and he used this media for the callus and cell suspension cultures of glycine max that is soybean belonging to the family Fabaceae. This media has a blend of white nutrients like inorganic salts, vitamins and carbohydrates. The speciality of this medium is that it has a higher concentration of nitrate and potassium and a lower concentration of ammonia when compared to your MS media or when compared to your LS media. This potassium nitrate is useful in inducing the soybean root callus formation and ammonium sulfate plays a role in the cell growth. This is also be used for protoplast culture. Gamboge medium actually is a very well or commonly used medium for the tissue culture propagation of mostly most of the legumes or in some cases we can use a combination of MS and B5 that is the major and minor of the MS with the B5 vitamins that can also help in the case of some legumes. Niche and niche medium. The medium was developed by Nish in 1969 for the establishment of in vitro anthoculture of Nicotiana from the family Solanaceae. This media has a very high concentration of thymine, biotin and folic acid and this supports anthocallus, anthoculture and anthocallus. See anther or the pollen grain culture is especially a very important field 
whereby we can develop haploid plants and try to study its developmental pathway. This normally is uh, the development of anthaculture between when you compare between monocots and dicots, the media composition you require is different. And even here, your normal MS and uh, B5 media or the LS media will not work or will not be as efficient as the NN media for anthaculture. So this NN medium is a specialized culture which has been uh, improved or the composition of which helps only specifically anthaculture. This was first developed as I said for Solanaceae for the Nicotiana plant. White's medium. This media was developed by White for the establishment of root culture of tomato. This was one of the earliest plant tissue culture media developed for root culture with a lower salt concentration and a higher concentration of magnesium sulphate. The concentration of nitrate is 19% lesser than the MS medium. Uh, establishing for the purpose of root culture and callus culture it can be used. It can also be by use for shoot culture. This is especially used for musa and daucus that is banana family and the carrot family. So, like this, we have so many compositions and combinations of media which can be manipulated. So when you choose a plant which you want to propagate by tissue culture, we choose the media. See, common is Murashige which works for most of the dicots and in the case some of the monocots also work. So once you establish a common platform, then you can do the mixing and matching of the different types of vitamins and adjust the concentrations to get the uh, result you are looking for, which is the maximum efficient callus formation and regeneration. Or if you are looking for a product formation, that. So then it will be the final composition would be based on your plant, your explant and the type of culture, whether it is protoplast, whether it is a bioreactor or whether it is a solid culture. That ultimately will actually decide what is the type of medium to be used. The questions in this particular uh, topic would be, how would you use these applications of tissue culture in the field of food technology as well as food processing? Thank you.